What up, cucks? It's your boy, the Hater, and it's time for another edition of Hater Outdoors, motherfuckers. I think it's about to rain, so hopefully I can avoid that while I do this video. Today's video was by far the easiest video I've ever made. To write the 25 reasons down took me less than one total minute. This was the easiest, and I could have easily come up with another 25 reasons. And the reason for that is because today we're doing 25 reasons why The Undertaker rules. Imagine if I said 25 reasons why he sucks, you know what I'm saying? I don't think anybody would agree with me. So, without further ado, let's get started. I'm pretty sure that everyone in the world is going to agree with all these reasons because they are absolute. Reason number one. He is a company man, motherfucks. He stuck around when people like Scott Hall and Kevin Nash did it. He stuck around forever, and he has always put the company ahead of himself. And this is the testament to a great human being, a great employee, and a great man. He is not someone that went to business for himself, because otherwise, he would have been like a 35-time WWE champion. But he wasn't. He was a champion only a handful of times. And despite this, Undertaker is a legend. Which brings me to reason number two. He had no problem taking a backseat to anyone, and ultimately this made him a legend. The Undertaker, as I famously said a few months ago, was above and first and foremost, fundamentally, I don't want to use the word mid-carder, because that, you know, when you think of mid-carder, you think of like Dolph Ziggler, but he was an upper mid-carder, meaning, it was very rare to see The Undertaker main event several pay-per-views in a row. Now, of course, obviously, in the context of wrestling, Undertaker can never be referred to as a mid-carder because he was a main eventer in that at any given pay-per-view, he could be in the main event. But his legend and his contributions are so much higher than people like, you know, Randy Orton, let's say, right? And Randy Orton has been in way more main events than Taker. But think about that. Think about that for just one minute. Right? He took a backseat to people like Stone Cold, to people like The Rock, to people like Brock Lesnar, sometimes Triple H, Shawn Michaels. He took a backseat to all these guys, that, uh, Randy Orton too, that at some point were the face of the company. And he did not demand to be the face of the company because he understood that he could never be the face of the company because he's not that kind of character. But that, in my opinion, is one of the most important reasons. Reason number three. He is a damn legend, motherfucks. Nobody can deny this. Reason number four. The dead man gimmick is one of the best gimmicks ever. Most people say it's the best gimmick ever. I don't know if it's the best, but it's definitely like top five, right? Um, gimmicks are up for subjective interpretation. Some people may think that Billy and Chuck were a better gimmick. Um, and that's perfectly fine. But I think everybody can appreciate that The Undertaker was one of the best gimmicks of all time. Reason number five, the American badass gimmick is one of the best gimmicks ever. I might even rank it higher than the dead man gimmick. The American badass gimmick is just awesome. He's basically a biker and he's just like this bad dude, but he's a face most of the time. It was great. Reason number six, he had a lot of moves. This is a personal favorite of mine because we always hear about all the things that Nakamura can do in the ring. Bullshit. Let me list you some of Undertaker's moves. Obviously, we've got the finishers. Tombstone, choke slam sometimes, last ride, Hell's Gate, remember that one? Jumping Tombstone, I'm not gonna count that as a different move, but you get the drift, right? Then he had the Snake Eyes, the Snake Eyes leg drop combination, which we can count as two moves because the leg drop is a separate move. He had the little, you know the clothesline he does when he runs and flips and clotheslines the guy as he's flipping? He had that. He had the, the old school, also known as the dead man walking. He had that. He had like the, the over the top rope dive, which I think he's one of the first guys to do it. Where he just runs like the one, the one that Roman Reigns does. He had that. He had that little running DDT thing. Uh, for a long time, he did this move where he wrenches the arm and throws the guy. He did like various chokes um, during his like hybrid uh, time, right? These are just the ones that come at the top of my head. Um, when you play as The Undertaker in WWE 2K24, you can use every move once and win. But if you play as Finn Balor, you have to spam the same move 100 times. The Undertaker is just built different. Uh, the big boot, the fucking uh, shoulder block that he used to do all the time, the, the stinger splash, basically, which doesn't really have a name, but the, you know, the stinger splash thing that he does, uh, the, the leg drop 
to the guy on the apron. Remember that one? That's a per personal favorite of your boys. So he's got the super choke slam. I mean, come on, I can go on all day about the Undertaker's moves. Uh, reason number seven. He had epic finishers that made sense with respect to his character. So Undertaker understood this and the importance of finishers, right? People like people with cool finishers. Number one, he had the tombstone, which is a short and sweet and very appropriate finisher for someone who is like a zombie demon thing, whatever the fuck he was, right? It's called the tombstone pile driver because you're going to die after it. And you're also laying as if you were being buried. And Undertaker serves as like the guy that holds you down and he kind of serves as the tombstone, right? And basically you died at the hands of the Undertaker. One of the most clever moves of all time in its presentation. Like when Taker crosses the arms, you know, like a vampire and he, he pins the guy and he kind of leans forward as if he were the tombstone that's standing over your grave. You understand me? Then he understood. This move cannot really be used all that often when I'm the, the American badass, right? So he came up with another move, another legendary move, the last ride. When I saw the last ride for the first time, I'm like, I can't believe no one has done this yet. It's one of those things where it's like, why wouldn't you try to get the guy a little bit higher? In my opinion, the last ride made the power bomb obsolete until Batista came around because it's like, why, would I, why the hell would I care about the, the, the power bomb that some like jobber is doing? Undertaker, who's like 6'8", is doing a last ride, you know? So, uh, and then the Hell's Gate and other things as well. But generally speaking, those two moves are just classic moves. Reason number eight, the streak became a thing and the streak is awesome. Reason number nine, on top of everything I just said, he had some of the best matches of all time. I'm talking about uh, Taker versus Jeff Hardy, Taker Shawn Michaels at Bad Blood, Taker versus Shawn Michaels 1 and 2 at fucking WrestleMania. Uh, Taker uh, versus Batista, Taker versus Edge, Taker versus Triple H a hundred times, Taker versus Lesnar. I mean, the list goes on and on. The Undertaker is one of the greatest in-ring guys of all time, and he never gets that uh, gets that praise, right? He never had a five-star match. Obviously, we know that doesn't mean anything, but it's like, according to Dave Meltzer, Andrade is a better in-ring guy, and Gargano is a better in-ring guy than The Undertaker, which is just ridiculous. Anyone who thinks that just needs to stop watching wrestling. You're not doing anyone any favors. Reason number 10. He was part of one of the best tag teams of all time, the Brothers of Destruction. Probably the most believable tag team of all time. More believable than the, than, uh, the Legion of Doom. More believable than, obviously, like, AOP, than uh, Axe and Smash. Like, more believable than everybody. Like, let's be real. Reason number 11. He was instrumental in a lot of legends becoming awesome. Right? The first legend that we can think of, of course, is Kane. Without Undertaker, there is no Kane, right? The entire gimmick of Kane doesn't work. The entire presentation of Kane doesn't work. The entire career of Kane doesn't work. And Kane would have been some goof with like a dancing gimmick, probably. And he likely would have never gotten as over as he did. Um, and then, of course, we have everybody else that Undertaker helped elevate uh, Edge, Batista, um, Edge and Christian when they were part of the Ministry of Darkness. Fucking Bradshaw, Farouk, he made all these guys. Big Show, he helped that guy become a star, you know what I mean? And then, of course, he put over a lot of people like The Rock and Stone Cold when necessary. Uh, reason number 12, I'll make you famous. One of my favorite catchphrases of all time, when Taker basically was doing this mini gimmick within a gimmick, and the gimmick was... Taker's not concerned with winning titles. I mean, if that happens, so be it. But Taker's concerned with making moments. And more importantly, he's concerned with making moments at someone else's expense. Which brings us to reason 13. He chokeslammed Rikishi off of this hell in a cell onto a truck bed. All right? Rikishi, that's probably the best moment of his career because it was truly awesome. And I was actually, I was like, oh my God, Rikishi might be dead. Like, I don't care what you fall on. That's a kind of crazy height. They're both tired, I'm sure, etc. right? But beyond that, he also threw Mick Foley around. Like, he's been part of some of the greatest moments, but nothing, in my opinion, more interesting than Rikishi being chokeslammed off and really pretty much putting a seal on Rikishi's career as a, as a jobber that he is. Reason number 15. Because he's a legend, he never needed to reinvent himself, but nevertheless did so very successfully. The Undertaker never needed to, like, if there's any character and any wrestler in the history of wrestling that did not need to change gimmicks, it was The Undertaker, right? He could have written the dead man thing all the way to the bank for his entire career, but he decided that times have changed. Attitude is now 
on Vogue, right? It's not time for someone to be a dead man anymore. So he came up with one of the greatest characters ever. And the fact that one man can be responsible for two of the greatest characters ever, while we have people like fucking Daniel Bryan, who are responsible for nothing, and people like Dean Ambrose, who are basically just a, a, lesser, a lesser stone cold, and CM Punk, who have no character, right? The Undertaker came up with two characters, and two of the all-time greats. Like, if you listen to all the characters in wrestling of all time, I, I firmly believe that both the Dead Man and the American Badass are going to be in the top 10 for everybody. Reason number, did I miss something? I think that was reason 15. So I think I missed reason uh, 14, motherfucks. Uh, reason 14, the chair spot. He invented the best chair spot of all time. It was the one where he grabs the wrestler after he whoops their ass, puts like the, the, the edge of the chair on their throat and then just slams them down. They added that to here comes the pain and I would do it all the time. And apparently, according to a little snippet that I saw, Maven was saying how it's the best spot ever because it doesn't hurt at all, right? But it just looks devastating. And more importantly than all that, it was unique, right? He was like, oh, I'm gonna use this differently. I'm not gonna just hit someone in the head of the chair. I'm gonna do something that just looks devastating and it's gonna be his thing. And forever, that will be the Undertaker chair spot. So since we already did 15, let's get to 16. He is the first mainstream character in any capacity to be dark. He's the first one, motherfucks. Oh, but if you watch Yoshinoru Takagashi's anime, I'm talking mainstream. I'm talking America and world, all right? I can't think of another character that was dark, that was important. Don't, don't, ah, uh, Thanos, shut the fuck up. I'm talking about like things that aren't for eight-year-olds. You know, and by the way, mini rent. You know what I mean? The hater, I used to like superheroes when I was a kid, even as a teenager. Then I saw Iron Man 1, which was amazing. But then after that, I was like, oh shit, I'm in my 20s. I have no interest in superhero movies. Like, it wasn't even like, I didn't make the decision. I'm like, oh, this is for kids. Like, I'm not going to watch this shit. But people nowadays, they're like, Thanos, oh, Cody Rhodes, Endgame. Like, shut the fuck up. Time to grow up, cucks. Uh, anyways, let's move on. Reason number 17. Back in the day, kids actually thought he was from hell, which is awesome, motherfucks. People were actually convinced of this up in this mug. Reason 19, uh, which goes, oh, sorry, 18. He is underrated on the mic. There's this weird thing that people say that Undertaker can't talk. Undertaker can't talk. And there's so many promos of the Undertaker, uh, like in the tail end, like when he was already transitioning from being the dead man and he was like Big Show's, you know, mentor during that time when him and Big Show became tag team champions. Like he wasn't the dead man anymore. He was just like essentially the American badass without the, the, the gimmick, right? And he would cut these awesome promos. And there's one where The Rock says some things and Undertaker says, listen to me, boy. Or some, you know, one of these Undertaker type shits, right? He's like, he's like, when I was wrestling, you know, you were like wiping your ass with your hand or whatever, right? He just buries him completely. And it just felt so real. It was like, oh shit, like The Rock really is speaking out of line here because let's be real. The Undertaker would have whooped his ass in real life. So, you know, the, he's lucky that he, the Undertaker let him skate with that shit. Reason 19, he kept kayfabe forever until now, you know? Forever, this guy was always wearing black. That's why people thought he was from hell, motherfucks. Reason number 20, he put wrestlers over in innovative ways. My personal favorite is how he put Cena over. That's when Cena got over. When Undertaker had a match with him and raised his hand to congratulate him. He did it with Jeff Hardy too, but Jeff Hardy was already over. Then he did it with like Orlando Jordan and that didn't work out, but he put people over in very interesting ways historically throughout his career, even Maven. Like with that beating that he gave Maven and he had like a, he, he went out of his way to have a mini feud basically with like fucking, you know, an, an undercard jobber, right? He let that guy eliminate him, the Undertaker in his prime, was eliminated by Maven from, from the Rumble and Taker like whooped his ass. But in doing that, Maven was able to show what he could do. He got TV time and he was presented as a badass because he's standing toe to toe with the Undertaker. He's not scared at least, right? Reason number 21, he was a locker room leader. And a real one at that. Reason number 22. He always had cool nicknames. Now, obviously, the coolest one is the American Badass. Or maybe the Dead Man. But he had so many. Red Devil, Big Evil. Remember that one, motherfucks? You know what I'm saying? Um, the Undertaker was just always cool. And that's what was awesome. My personal Undertaker, my favorite Undertaker, was the Red Devil, Big Evil Undertaker. When he turned heel and he betrayed JR and he cut his hair short. I was like, this is fucking badass. This is just completely different, you know? Um, reason number 23. He had, bar none, it's not even close, 
the best collection of entrance themes of all time. So, first, he has all the iterations of the Dead Man music, right? That's a classic. Um, then he had, think about this, he had, he had like a generic one at first, but which was just like noise. Then he had American Badass by Kid Rock, which is an awesome song to this day. He had uh, Rollin' by Limp Bizkit, which for some reason, even though it shouldn't have, it fit him well. Now, for those of you who don't know, Kid Rock and Limp Bizkit are obviously awesome. But in the 90s, they were like as big as your little Taylor Swifts are today, cucks. They were huge. This was legit mainstream. It wasn't like people think of Kid Rock now and he's not as popular, even though he still does good shit once in a while. But people think he's not as popular. But back in the 90s, when Undertaker was American Badass, that was like everyone's favorite song. That was like a summer hit, cucks. Reason number, and of course, I shouldn't stop this reason before I talk about my favorite Undertaker theme, which is Dead Man Walking. Da, 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 da. And then, you know, you've done it now. You've gone and made a big mistake. That's one of my favorite theme songs of all time because it really fit him perfectly. Reason 24, this is how good this list is because 24 normally would be like reason one for most people. Reason 24. He was believable, motherfucks. He was big, strong, athletic, and looked like a badass. And reason 25, a personal favorite, the decade of destruction. When Undertaker hit his 10-year mark in WWF, WWE, they, they kept talking about the decade of destruction, meaning that unlike most people who had been there for a handful of, of months or years, the Undertaker had been there for 10 years uh, and dominated for 10 years but the implications back then were like oh the undertaker has been here for 10 years he's ready to hang it up the undertaker always looked older than he was because during like 2000 he was what he was like 31 or you know he was like a young guy right and despite the fact that he looked old at 31 when he was on his second gimmick he already had a hall of fame career then i remember several years later shelton benjamin people were would, would start saying like, oh, Sean Benjamin's been around for 10 years. And it made me realize, like, wow, in 10 years, you can become The Undertaker or you can do nothing. Like, Shelton Benjamin was around for 10 years, and I love Shelton Benjamin, but let's be real. 10 years, and it didn't feel like it. It felt like he was there for two months because he didn't do anything. He had some meaningless title reigns. Oh, he was Intercontinental Champion. I know, but it was meaningless. Nobody cared that he was Intercontinental Champion, right? Nowadays, you have people like Dolph Ziggler, 17, 19 years, whatever, in the company. You don't feel it at all. You have people, motherfucks. Like Kevin Owens is now like seven years into this company. Does it feel like it did with The Undertaker? Does it feel like if Kevin Owens finishes his career now, he's had a Hall of Fame career? I'm sure they're going to put him in there, but he doesn't deserve it. The Undertaker, in his 10-year mark, was already a legend. And who the fuck would have thought that he'd still be around, arguably, to this day? That he would still be around like two WrestleManias ago? Nobody, when you watch wrestling, you're like, you have like 19 year old Jeff Hardy, you got like a bunch of people, Edge, Christian, a bunch of younger dudes, and you're like, oh, these guys are gonna carry the torch or they're gonna find new ones. But Undertaker outlasted fucking everybody, motherfucks. He sure as shit outlasted everyone that was relevant in the Attitude Era. He even outlasted people like Cena and Triple H. And like, best believe, motherfucks, the Saudis are gonna pull out a check one day and we're gonna see another Taker match. So I look forward to that. I know a lot of people are like, nice oh, match with Goldberg, shut up. I'd rather see that than see Mansoor versus fucking Cesaro. Nobody wants to see this shit. People want to see The Undertaker play up. And with that being said, it's been a complete honor to even do this list. It made me realize how much I like The Undertaker because I was never a big taker guy. I was always a rock guy. When I was really young, I liked The Rock and Jeff Hardy was probably my favorite wrestler. And then as I got older, I, I started liking the heels more. So I liked like Triple H. I liked JBL is one of my favorites of all time. You know, like I never was, I liked Heel Undertaker, but I never was a big fan of the American Badass. Like I always thought Triple H should have come out on top a few more times, right? I was a Kurt Angle fan eventually when I started liking heels. But now that all has been said and done, you know, when we're talking about the greatest of all time, and this speaks a lot of volumes, because people expect the greatest of all time to be like Cena, Hogan, Ric Flair. Because a lot of times they measure based on how many world titles someone had. But I don't think that's an effective measure. In my opinion, The Undertaker is, he's gotta be one of the best of all time. Like, if I were doing like a list, like an objective list, 
right? Of people that, basically a combination of people that have achieved the most and that I think are objectively the best, right? It would be like Rey Mysterio would be in there just for his longevity. Jericho would be in there. The Undertaker would also be in there, motherfucks. And the problem is that instead of people giving him his flowers, which they do, I'm not going to say they don't, people, even when he was around, like they're lucky that they didn't put Undertaker to squash Daniel Bryan because the dumbass fans would have lost their minds. Daniel Bryan, who hasn't had like one one hundredth the career of the Undertaker, people would have booed Taker and cheered on Daniel Bryan. That being said, motherfucks, I think I made my points. Hater out. Cuckolds!